We are growing a nation of victims. We are convincing people all across the nation of America that because of your race, creed, color, gender, age, you're a victim. But the problem is there's so many individuals who have broken out of that, who said, you know what? You may tell me that, but that ain't gonna apply to me. I refuse to be the victim. I'm gonna be a victor. I'm gonna drive forward. You know why? Self leadership. You know, you're waiting for somebody to save you, for the cavalry to come, but 90% of the time, it ain't gonna happen. When a life ambush happens, what is the REACT methodology? So REACT is an acronym. Uh, the, the, the first one, when you get punched in, the, punched in the face with whatever adversity it is, the R stands for you've got to recognize your reality. And that's probably the hardest thing as humans. We just have a natural tendency that when bad things start to develop, we don't want to admit they're happening. Uh, because once we admit they're happening, then we have to deal with the reality of, oh, my God, like I, my life is about to go off course. Like it's like right. you're, it's like the accident is happening and, you know, or you're watching a train wreck unfold and it's like, no, but you so you don't want to admit it. So it's human nature that we procrastinate, we deny, we ostrich, we stick our head in the sand and we're like, oh, well, maybe if I just hide, this will go away. 95% of the time, it never does. So recognizing our reality is the biggest thing and the thing that we need to do the fastest. Uh, number two is evaluating your assets. What are the tools that you have in your toolbox? And those moments where there's no hope, it's out of my control, there's nothing I can do, those are lies. And the reality is when we start to realize there are tools in our toolbox, I mean, if you take my gunfight as an example, even though I was all shot up, you know, I had been around long enough and, and as a leader, I knew, okay, what are the assets I have in this situation? I knew I had my teammates back at the house, you know, our, our separate group about 150 yards away. I had a Marine Corps quick reaction force on uh, standby about two kilometers away. We had helicopters overhead. I had a special operations aviation medevac helicopter. I had an a Air Force a AC-130 gunship. These were the tools that I had to bring to bear on this problem. Life's no different. If, if you suddenly get diagnosed with cancer, okay, who are the doctors that I know? I need oncologists. I need my family support system. I need all the, these are my tools to deal with this problem. So number three, is assess possible options and outcomes. So once we know what tools we have, now we begin to look at, okay, what's the right tool to use? And oftentimes people make the mistake of grabbing the first tool and being like, oh my God, I'm in a crisis. Let me use this tool. Frequently, it may not be the right tool. So this is where we need to take a pause. And in the military, we call this, we need to let the battlefield develop. This is where we bring our teammates in, our friends in, our, if it's a business crisis, our business partners, our business associates, our subject matter experts, and we look at everything that's going on and we make sure, okay, we have a good grasp of what this emergency is. Now let's start to look at option A, what's that outcome? Let's play this out. If we go, take this path, what does it truly look like? Um, and, and frequently understanding that sometimes that short-term pain, the harder path is actually the better path even though typically in a crisis, it's not the one we want to take. Uh, number four, the C in React is choose a direction and communicate it. So as a leader, we've gone through this process, we've identified the different options, and we, you know, as a team, typically we say, hey, <laughs> this is the best worst decision. And that's hard often for leaders. Uh, so what will happen, you'll walk away from that and we'll start doing what a lot of people do. We ruminate over it. Oh, my God, we thought B was good, but geez, I don't know. I'm going to have to cut this division or it's going to cost me so much money or whatever it is. Doesn't matter. Choose that direction, communicate it. It accomplishes three things. Number one, the second it gets out of your head, it's no longer an idea. It becomes action off your lips. You, you as leaders, typically, once we say something, we follow it, we execute it because we put it out there. Number two, you're never on the X alone. Your team members, your family, your friends get pulled onto the X with you when there's a major crisis. So when you tell others, this is what we're going to do, that generates number three, hope. That generates hope. You're saying, hey, we're in a crisis, but guess what? This is what we're going to do. Yes. All right. We've got a plan. And then the fifth one, and, and Jeff, you kind of mentioned this earlier, T is take action, execute. So many people, this is a stall point because people are waiting for the perfect moment. You know, in a crisis, they've come up with a plan and then suddenly they're like, oh, 
So a gunfight being a perfect example, a lot of people are waiting for the bullets to stop flying. A really well-trained force knows how to knows how to shoot. So T is take action, execute. Movement is life. Movement creates momentum, like you were talking about earlier. And uh, that's when it enables you to get off that X. And if you go from one X to the next, guess what? React again and mm. overcome and get off the X. I love that framework. You know, I'm thinking about, <clears throat> I've had a few of these ambushes in my day. And there was one in particular in 2018 when I sold a business and basically got kind of screwed on the deal. Um, you know, I'm not pointing a finger, just circumstances happened. And I ended up basically getting screwed out of like seven figures plus. And so this, this runway, this financial cushion that I thought I had just got revoked, like, you know, rug pull with, with really no heads up. It was kind of like, I was like, Hey, I didn't get my payment this month. And they're like, yeah, we're going to check on that. And then, yeah, you're never gonna. So that was it. Yeah. And as I'm hearing this react model methodology, I'm, I'm replaying that in my mind. And I'm like, I had no name for it, but that's exactly what I did. Yeah. You know, and, and where I'm at now, this podcast, the book that I mentioned, the business that I'm running, literally everything that I have now professionally in my life came out of that moment and that process. And it's, it's pretty cool, at least for one anecdotal bit of evidence to say, this really works, man. You've had a crazy experience, not just seeing some stuff, but I mean, like you literally got hit in the face with it. Um, what you, what, eight times, I think you got shot. Yeah. I haven't even been shot once. So I don't, maybe, I don't I, I at don't risk remember. of asking you right. a question that you've been asked a million times, like, what's that like getting shot? Uh, it, it hurts, uh, a lot, you know, <laughs> it's not quite like the movies, although, yeah. you know, the interesting thing there, there are different levels of gunshots. So there are gunshots mm -hmm. that are called a through and through, meaning it hits muscle and it goes directly through. There's also high velocity, low velocity. I mean, we could get into all of it. So for me, it, it hurt. I was uh, struck twice. Uh, I was struck twice in the, the elbow. So I don't know if you can see some of the damage mm -hmm. twice in the one arm hit me in the lower bicep and the other round hit me uh, right on the inside of my forearm. And it just effectively destroyed my elbow Two PCAM machine gun rounds, which is a, a bullet about my thumb. Um, and then, uh, and then I was stitched across the body armor. I was hitting the helmet. I was hit uh, off my weapon. Uh, left night vision tube shot. Off. And then, of course, I took a round in the face. So with the arm, what I tell people is, okay, everybody's kind of hit their funny bone. And yeah. you get that fun, stinging, tingling, uncomfortable feeling. It was kind of like that, but amplified by like a thousand. Um, it was like a gorilla hit me in the arm with a bat. And then like a lightning bolt traveled up my arm and just struck me in the back of the, of the skull. Uh, and then I couldn't feel anything in my arm, a lot of pain, but I just couldn't feel anything. So my initial thought was my arm had been shot off. Um, <clears throat> what I didn't know at the time is my arm probably caught on my gear. So when I reached over and couldn't feel it, I had no feeling in my arm. I was like, holy shit, my arm got shot off. Um, gunfight continued took rounds off body armor, you know, like I said, weapon nods, side plate. Uh, and I turned to get out of that, that, you know, uh, <laughs> that uh, hail of gunfire. And I caught a round in the face. It caught me right in front of the ear, traveled through my face, uh, exited the right side of my nose. So it took off most of my nose, blew out my right cheekbone, broke it and kicked it out to the right. Uh, broke all the bones above my eye, my eye, vaporized my orbital floor, broke the head of my jaw, shattered my jaw to my chin, and it uh, and it knocked me out. So, so like out, like you're unconscious. Unconscious. Uh, did you even, did you even did you even know you'd been shot in the face, or were you unconscious before you were even aware? No, I I well, I don't I don't remember the impact of being shot in the face. Um, and I'll be honest, when I first came to, it wasn't like, holy shit, I got shot in the face. It was more like, uh, it was more like my brain was in a fog and trying to figure out what happened. Like I knew that it, it was kind of like the world slowly opened back up. Like, okay, where am I? What's going on? Did, did you lose vision on that side? Uh, yes and no. So 
uh, th my vision was damaged and the doctors were, but it was more damage to, because my orbit was broken and destroyed, my eye dropped into this newfound hole in my face and my eye muscles were damaged. The eye itself miraculously uh, was not damaged. So it became more of a vision alignment problem over the years to try and fix. Mm -hmm. And to this day, when I'm looking straight, my vision's good. They fix that uh, anytime. Like if I look up like this, or if I break my field of vision, I get double vision, but so what mm -hmm. I turn my head, but right. um, th this is, uh, this is actually uh, an acrylic model of my skull. The doctor wow. put me back together. So I don't know if you guys, if you're, if you're, it. if you're listening to this on podcast, on any of the podcast platforms, go to YouTube, look up Jeff Lerner, go to the unlock your potential playlist, find the episode with Jason Redman and go to, I don't know, what are we maybe five minutes in? Yeah. You got to see this. Like this is, this is worth the vision. And it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, literally it's like almost as if somebody took an ax and hit me in the face was the yeah. amount of damage we sustained, which is really cool to look at and how blessed I am. Why we, we created the no bad days line. We basically designed the shirts around my skull and, and just, Oh, you got day. it on the back of your shirt. Yeah. Dude, are, can, are, is this shirt like available on your website? I mean, I like. Oh, absolutely, man! We got a, we got sweatshirts, we got okay. t-shirts. The the no bad days line, people love it. I tell you, when I speak, I talk to people about that about perspective, man. Just be so thankful you're alive. I'm so thankful. I look at that skull, and it just gives me so much perspective. When other people are like, "Oh my God, I had a bad day," I'm like, "Man, you don't know what a bad day is." You know, what, what you're misinterpreting as a bad day is really nothing more than a schedule disruption. True bad days need to meet four criteria or at least mm -hmm. two of the three. It's going to leave mental scars. Hold on. I'm, I'm scars. actually, if you'll bear, hang on a second. I'm literally pulling up my notes so that I can write down like bad day, four criteria. Go ahead, please. Yeah. It, a, a true bad day, in my opinion, is what I call a life ambush. Like I survived an enemy ambush, everybody gets ambushed in life. And this is where we have perspective problems because so many people use that phrase. I mean, you and I meet people all the time, you know, these negative people are like, oh my God, I had a bad day. And I'm like, oh, wow, what happened, man? And they're like, oh my, you know, I wasn't able to get my coffee or the line in Starbucks was too long or I had a flat tire. And I'm like, dude, that's not a bad day. That's a schedule disruption. A true bad day is it will leave mental, physical, emotional or deep financial scars. You never fully recover from those things. You, every, you will always look back and say, oh my God, and, and think with pain over that event. I, I think of the night I was wounded. When I look back on it, it's still painful to think about. I, and I've been through about four major life ambushes. So if it doesn't meet those criteria, it's not really a bad day. That's why I say no bad days. You have hard days, you have tough days. But if you wake up breathing, man, it's a good day. It's up to you to make it a great day. You know, I have a, a friend named Brad Lee. A lot of people know who he is. And he, yeah. he, he said, you probably know who Brad is. And he says something all the time. He's like, he's like, you know, people wake up and they say, oh, I got to get up early. I have to go to my work. And it's, he's like, no, you get to wake up early. You get to go to your job. He said, if I gave you a million dollars tonight when you were going to sleep to, to, and, and said, Hey, congrats. Here's a million dollars. And you don't have to wake up in the morning. Like you're dead. You, you don't get it. You don't get any more days, but here's that million bucks. You've been working so hard. For. Like, would you take it? And of course you wouldn't take it. No. You'd, everybody would rather have tomorrow than a million dollars. So when tomorrow comes, it can't be, it, it can't be a bad day. Cause you've already defined it as being worth more than a million bucks. Cause you wouldn't have traded it. And so I, it's, it's so true. Um, you know, and, and I just want to say, I, I appreciate being able to ask this kind of almost level of like graphic questions, because, you know, what, what I don't want to do is dehumanize you, Jason Redmond, the man, and into just being you, the, wo the wound or the trauma, and oh, let's, let's go all deep into that. But I think it's, there's so much value in this, this vulnerability to be able to share about something like this, because it's like, it's visceral and it connects with people like say, oh yeah, you didn't have a bad day. You've never been shot. People are like, yeah, whatever. But like to actually talk to somebody who got shot in the face, had their eyeball fall into their cheek so that if it could see, it would have been looking at its own tongue or what, I mean, like that level of, of, of almost gore, it, 
to me, it contextualizes what you're saying of like, we really, like those of us that have not been through something like that, like we don't have a fucking clue what a bad day is. And we should probably stop talking about it. It, it, it's so, I mean, I speak, it's one of the biggest things. It's funny. There are a lot of different topics, you know, that I speak on the idea of getting off the X, which the X is any point of attack or adversity or crisis <clears throat> for us in the military. It was kind of an ambush term or an attack term, but so many people get stuck on the X in their mind. And, and, and it really, it just comes down to perspective. It comes down to poor perspective. You know, if, if you live in America, man, you live in one of the greatest countries in the world. And it drives me insane right now, all the division. And, the, and, and right now, I don't know if you know this, but there's a major virus going on. And um, I've heard, and, and, and on, I've but, contracted it twice. So yeah, well, actually, it. you probably haven't contracted because the virus I'm talking about isn't the one you think I am. Oh, okay. Yeah, the virus I took, I'm talking I took the about, bait, so thank you. I that. did, I know. <laughs> I love throwing it out there to people. The virus I'm talking about is the victim mindset. We mm. are growing a nation of victims. We are convincing uh, people all across the nation of America that because of your race, creed, color, gender, age, demographic, where you came from, your religion, you know, your, your gender affiliation, whatever it is, you're a victim. And you can't get ahead unless somebody else helps you. And people are buying into this hook, line, and sinker. And we got to break that mindset. You live in one of, we live in one of the greatest countries in the world, freedom and opportunity. And why this is so untrue is there are millions and millions of super successful Americans who came from all those different demographics who said, you know what, that ain't me. I'm going to break out of this. I might have grown up on the poor streets of Chicago, but guess what? I'm leaving. I'm going someplace else and making a name for myself or, or launching a business for myself. That's freedom and opportunity. And, and so many people buy into this victim mindset and they buy into this negative mindset of, oh my God, I had a bad day because X, Y, Z. And, uh, and it's, it's just not true. It's a lie. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's so interesting and, and Jermaine, you're talking about this. I'm just, I actually have, I'm looking at it over on my other screen right now. I have seven pages left to finish editing the final draft of my book. I wrote a book and it's almost done and I got to get it to the publisher. Like literally this week, I have seven pages left. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to be done. But in, I'm in this section right now that is like right with what you're saying. And it's talking about how as human beings, we, we're so, we're always, we're so wired in to our external environment, right? And, and I, I mentioned to you, I have a, a, a really good friend who was a SEAL uh, as well. His name's Larry. And he talks about this a lot. He's like, you know, and, and especially like we're, whether you're in the military or not, you're trained to be highly attuned to your external environment because, you know, you consider that to be your life conditions and the, the general determinant of where you are and where you're going is like what's around you. And we, we, we de-emphasize what's inside of us, right? And so because of that, when we get in trouble or when we have stress or what he defines as, you know, stress or trauma is like when we, when we become aware of our inability to control the world around us, that's actually how he defines trauma. Anyway, he's like, what we immediately do is we look to other people and other things to save us. We look to the collective and we're, and, and it's kind of what you're saying. Like we're in this world now where everybody's waiting on everybody else to make things better or to make things fair or to make things safe. And, you know, if, if somebody says, why is America the greatest country on earth? You know, I, I, you get this range of answers, right? You know, oh, dem democracy, freedom, you know, we stay values, we're the world's police force, we're the greatest economy, this, that. The only reason America is the greatest place on earth, the greatest country on earth, if assuming it still is, and you know, I think this would be the standard by which you would judge that is who are you individually capable of becoming in America? Yeah. If you are capable, if, if you are capable of becoming a greater version of yourself here, then you could become anywhere else. Then this is the greatest country on earth. If, if you could move to Norway and become a better version of yourself than you could ever become here, then I would suggest Norway must be the greatest place on earth, right? It's only ever about the individual and what the individual is capable of. And that's really the only standard by which we should be, be evaluating anything. And yet, to your point, we're so wired now to feel like we need the collective to be okay. 
or, or even you're placed into the victim box. You know, if you are um, a minority or if you are a woman, you know, you're discriminated against and you can't get ahead. And don't get me wrong. There is some discrimination out there. There's no doubt about it. There are some assholes out there that that blatantly or at least covertly will discriminate. But the problem is there's so many individuals who have broken out of that who said, you know what? You may tell me that, but that ain't going to apply to me. I refuse to be the victim. I'm going to be a victor. I'm going to drive forward. And there are, there are amazing minorities and women and all, you know, all across the board in the victim buckets that you know, society right now and the media wants to place people into that are super successful. They are yeah. CEOs. They are multimillionaires. And they came from all the areas that you're trying to tell all these other people. Well, if you came from that area, you can't be successful. Well, what about these people? These people that did it, they came from the same area. You know why? Because it comes down to what we talked about, self-leadership, which is everything I speak on. You know, you're waiting for somebody to save you, for the Calvary to come. But 90% of the time, it ain't going to happen. 90% of the time. And, and even if it did the level of success that you're going to find from somebody else dragging you up is significantly different from you grinding and climbing and getting to the top on your own self-leadership, building those relationships, building a team, having an overcome mindset. That's, that's what does it. And we're losing that. I think America was built on those principles and we're losing that now. We need to bring it back desperately. Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I love that term you said. I want to make sure I capture it in my, my mental vault, the mo moving off the X. Is that what you called it? Yeah. The X. So the X is wherever you are, where the bad thing is happening. That's right. So I, su I survived a vicious enemy ambush. And, and as a SEAL, I had spent the majority of my adult life looking at how do we contain the enemy into a certain place, whether it was a specific target whether it was an ambush point, whatever it was, we we would go out and we would conduct conduct operations uh, frequently in the last you know 20 years was to capture or kill an individual, uh, usually a bad person on the battlefield. And when we did that, we would lock down an area. And then if it escalated to a certain point, then we would try and pour as much, you know, firepower and explosives and whatever to either totally contain that individual. Uh, but overwhelmed them to the point that either they were killed or they lost their will to fight. And uh, on September 13, 2007, the day that I was ambushed, I found out what that feels like to be on the receiving end of that. And it mm -hmm. sucks. It's so overwhelming, um, you know, to have that level of firepower rain down on you. And, and typically when these things happen, whether it's a, a gunfight or now we get into the life ambush, believe it or not, the way the human body reacts and the mind reacts is the same. So I have a lot of people that hear me say, oh, my God, you know, you were all shot up in this gunfight. You know, I can't relate to that. But that's not true, because in a life ambush, no different from an enemy ambush, when you're on the point of attack, the crisis, the adversity, you just got punched in the mouth, whatever level of trauma. And uh, I define life ambushes as as, um, you know, we already talked about the criteria, you know, mental, physical, emotional or deep financial scars, but when they happen, it can be something on the lower end of the spectrum, like the ending of a relationship, um, you know, divorce, uh, personal failure, personal crisis, you know, personal or professional crisis. It could be a lawsuit. It could be uh, bankruptcy. It could be the failure of your company. It could be life-threatening illness or injury or an accident to you or someone you love. It could be sexual trauma to you or someone you love. It could be the unexpected loss of someone you love or the higher end of the spectrums, you know, sexual trauma to a child or um, the loss of a child. These are major life ambushes. And when they happen to us, no different than I felt in that gunfight, everybody else feels the same way. We feel a feeling of no hope. We feel a feeling of there's nothing I can do. We feel a feeling of it's totally outside my control, um, all these things. And the interesting thing is if we hooked you, you know, whoever you are out there that's going through a life ambush right now, you know, whatever you're going through, up to medical devices that measured brainwave activity, respirations, you know, all these different things, and you were able to go back and hook me up to it in the middle of my gunfight, they'd actually be very similar.
because the human mind doesn't say, oh, I'm being shot at. The human mind says, oh, my God, this is an emergency situation. You know, release stress, release, uh, you know, endorphins and all these different things that jack our body up and go into the fight or flight mode. So this is when we're on the X and this is when we're totally overwhelmed with what's going on around us. But just like in my gunfight, the reason I survived and, and my team survived is we had been taught one critical principle that when you are in an ambush, when you're attacked, you have to get off the X as quickly as possible. And, and thankfully, my teammates did an amazing job. We also had an incredible Air, Air Force AC-130 gunship aircraft up overhead that brought in a fire mission that enabled us to get off the X. But you have to do the same things in your own life. You have to have a mindset of, hey, man, no matter how great you live your life, bad things happen to good people. And at some point, all of us in this life get on the X. I tell people, the average person in, in Overcome is where I talk a lot about these principles. And we estimated that the average person will go through a minimum of five, mm-hmm. five major life ambushes, not even like minor ones. I'm talking majors, like, like, you know, being shot to shit in a gunfight, you know, and fighting for your life. That's a major life ambush. Another one of my major life ambushes was I had a big leadership failure that almost got me kicked out of the SEAL teams and, and, and earning back the credibility and respect of my teammates, hardest road mm. I've ever walked, major life ambush. These things take time, but they have, a, this is the essence of the overcome mindset. It is a mindset of, I don't know what the future holds for me, but no matter what, when these moments come, I'm going to get off the X as quickly as possible. Understanding that timeline is a little relative. If you lose a child, I don't expect you the next day to come skipping outside and being like, hey, man, you know, I lost my child yesterday, but I'm so ready to take on the world. Timeline's relative, but you know that no matter what, you can't just lay on the X. And there are a lot of people out there that do it. They lay on the X and they, they focus on what they lost. They focus on where they should be, or they focus on someone or something to blame. And they just lay there. And the X is like quicksand. The longer you sit on it, the more it pulls you down and the harder it is to get up and go. You know, I think you just sort of referenced a really interesting dynamic that I hadn't really thought about before in terms of how we deal with, and I I like the term life ambushes. When you made the comment about somebody losing a child, for example, that I think the way we respond, the the way we respond is driven by not so much what happened, but what else could happen. And what I mean is, in your case, if you're getting shot at, you go, okay, I have to move. Because if I sit here, I'm likely to get shot at again. Right? So you're going to move. And and that motion, we all, I mean, you know, at least those of us in, that are obsessed over personal development, like you and I do anyway, um, are, when we hear the word emotion, we, we immediately think from motion, we feel based on our motion. And so motion changes emotion. And so just that act of moving, I, I wasn't in the gunfight, but I've been in other situations, just that act of moving, it kind of auto generates a sense of hopefulness, right? And the reason you move is because if you stay still, whatever bad happened could happen again. But let's say you lose a child. Well, sitting in it, call it wallowing in it. It's not like it's not like it's going to happen again. You're not going to lose another child because you're sitting still. And so there I think that creates almost a complacency. And and, and I've never been in that situation. So I, I, I say this with no judgment, but I'm just thinking like the fact that something horrible just happened and you're not in imminent danger of it happening again can actually make it a trap that keeps you from moving. And, and could potentially, and thus keeps you from auto generating that sense of hopefulness that can come from motion. And so it's almost like if something horrible happens that's of a nature where it's not likely to repeat, there is that much more onus on us to act as if it will if we don't move. But the downside is that's a myth and it's a, it's a lie that we're telling ourselves. And you're right. But so I teach something called the react methodology. It's a system to go through to get off that X. Okay. Um, but Can you talk you, about that? My, I will tell you my audience, like we love tactical, almost nerdy, 
like ways to be better at life. So please Absolutely. share if you no, want. The react methodology is a big one that a lot of people use, but, but I, I want to say one point oftentimes when something really bad like that happens, you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right, Jeff, that it, it almost becomes an excuse for people to sit on the X, mm. especially something as devastating as the loss of a child. Like people, well, of course I'm falling apart. I lost a child, but it becomes an excuse. And, and almost to the point that I've watched people um, I've seen this in the wounded warrior community that have endured really bad trauma on the battlefield, whether it was the, with themselves or the loss of a friend. And that incident becomes an excuse for every bad behavior there is. And they, they spiral down and become a lesser version of the person they once were. And everything is justified because of that life ambush that happened, you know, whether it's the loss of a child or the loss of a friend or whatever it is. So self-medication, uh, you know, alcoholism, risky sexual behaviors, you know, affairs, whatever it is, all of it is, well, uh, you know, I'm doing this because of what happened. It's because of this. And to me, that's not leading yourself. You're, you're using that as an excuse. And, and anyone you've lost or anything that's happened, especially, I mean, if we use the case of a teammate or a friend that's lost or a child that's lost, do you honestly think that they would be happy to know that you spiral down into a lesser version of yourself. I mean, how in that way are you honoring who they were or their memory? I mean, I think about my teammates and I'm like, every day I should be driving out there trying to be great so I can honor them because they're not here to do it. Like they give yeah. anything to have one more day on this earth. So like I should be getting out of bed and like hitting the day running and helping to make other people better. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know, you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. So I'm curious, and, and I know you mentioned that kind of you're starting to, cause we're talking about ambushes and like preparedness, right? Um, you're starting to, before, before we hit record, we were talking about how you're starting to actually like train people on, on preparedness and, and, you know, kind of moving into this world of wild and crazy uncertainty that we see unfolding all around us. There's kind of a level of preparedness that is becoming almost more essential and, and a little less, maybe call it fringe. Yeah. You know, th I mean, there've been, there've been preppers for decades. Right. But like, there's some crazy stuff going on in this world. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of your thoughts on that and some of what you're doing and even maybe how to apply some of these principles in the world we're in to the great unknown that we're heading towards? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I focused when I got out of the military on, on leadership. I have a unique leadership story from having failed as a leader and then rebuilt myself as a leader. So I have become a tremendous student in leadership. So my focus was leadership, but not in the essence that most people think about. It's, it always goes back to self-leadership. That is truly the essence of leadership, how we lead ourselves. So I was teaching self-leadership and I was teaching how to build a, a, an overcome mindset. How do we deal with the adversity we encounter in this life? How do we get off the X? All those things. And, and as I'm watching the world, I have deep concerns for our future. Uh, I, I think our political leaders on both sides are a shit show. Um, you know, we have moved so far to the fringe on both sides where there's a whole lot of people in the middle of America that are just like us who, you know, you know, black or white, Christian or Muslim, man or woman, it doesn't matter. We're about just having a great life for ourselves. We want the freedom to make choices. We want the freedom to take care of our business. We want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we're so far on the fringe that it's causing chaos in our nation right now. I mean, you look at this pandemic, you look at um, in my opinion, there's an attack on freedom of speech. There's an attack on many things, supply chain problems. We're seeing employment issues. And that really worries me for the future. So a lot of people started talking to me about, Jay, you got, you know, all this experience, you know, not only were you a SEAL, I was a SEAL instructor. I taught marksmanship. I taught uh, survival, evasion, and escape. And I started, you know, I've mentioned to people, hey, man, well, these are the things that I'm doing to be ready 
And, and which is the fundamental question that I ask so many people, you know, when I talk about an overcome mindset, I ask this question, will you be ready? And people will say to me, well, for what? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. Hmm. We don't know what the future holds. I mean, one of the greatest things I think the SEAL teams did so well was we always, we were almost sadistic in the worst case scenarios we would think up. Like, you know, <laughs> hey, what if uh, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man sh showed up and attacked us? And, you know, I mean, just silliness, but, and then we, you know, crank it up to 10 levels higher. People don't need to do that in this light, it, it, quite to that level. You know, you talked about preppers at the beginning. I think preppers are on the far side of uh, preparing for, you know, a, a crisis scenario. But I think one of the good things that SEAL teams were at is we at least put time and effort into any bad scenario that we could come up with. And I think people need to start having a mindset of that. Um, this attack on law enforcement, the defunding, you look at the massive crime that's exploding in the major cities across this country. I'm dumbfounded at the reports I read of, of um, bad things that are happening all across the country. So how do you be ready? So I'm moving into three different categories. So the mindset will continue. You got to have a mindset of self-leadership and how do you how do you prepare? How do you have an overcome mindset for these bad situations? You need to know how to survive. Uh, so we're getting into that. How do you if the worst happens, get out of, if you live in the cities, you need to get out of the cities as quickly as possible. The cities are going to be one of the worst places to be if you see a societal collapse, whether the dollar fails, whether the grid gets shut down, uh, you name it, you know. Yeah, I'm curious, what do, you, what do you think are, and, and I'm not going to say they're likely, but let's just call them the more likely scenarios. Like what are the, what are some of the, I mean, you mentioned too, dollar collapse, by the way, just wrote like, 50 pages about that in my book. Like I'm right there with you. Uh, the grid, I'm not as informed on that, but I hear about it a lot. Like what our, else? Our, our, our electrical infrastructure is in bad shape. Yeah. And we really need to put some time and effort into it. You know, it's a mess. And I mean, imagine, you know, so the future wars, it, it would be unlikely, but possible that you would see an all out attack on American soil. I mean, we still have a pretty damn strong military. We are weak. Uh, when it comes to our ability to fight cyber threats. So, you know, Russia, China, we, they see us weak right now. They, they are loving the fact we're so divided as a nation. We are a mess. Yeah. And if you look at the uh, USSR, the USSR was in a similar situation before they collapsed. So what other nations will do is they'll look at how do we push them over the edge? Well, let's just launch a massive cyber attack that, that attacks their financial systems, that takes away their power. So imagine you wake up and suddenly you can't access your money. You have no power. It, it very quick. I mean, look at, I mean, just look at the pandemic. I mean, people lost their minds over toilet paper. Yeah. And, and, to, and to be fair, and I'm not downplaying, you know, the, the very real tragedy of the pandemic, but that wasn't the most virulent disease that's, you know, made the rounds. I mean, if it had been hantavirus, you know, if hantavirus was a little more contagious, yeah. now that's a pandemic, you know? And, and, and yeah. So, I mean, I do, I do think about that sometimes. Like what, what if it had been instead of whatever the mortality rate is, you know, 0.2% or something, what if it had been 2%? Right. Absolutely. Or Ebola which I don't yeah. even know. I mean, is it 30%? I mean, yeah, exactly. Ebola kills. So, regardless, how, how do you do? So it's mindset survival and then defense. You know, people think, you know, people think, oh, the police will always be there to protect me. But if there is a massive chaos happening in the cities or happening, the police are going to be so tied up that if there is a massive crime wave or and unfortunately, it's human nature that bad people take advantage of bad situations. Yeah, um, cops have families, too. Absolutely. You know? So whether, well, whether they're trying to protect a city that's in chaos or whether they're just like, Hey, screw it. I'm going to take care of my own family. Mm -hmm. You know, that call, because you are facing a dangerous situation, you know, it could take 10, 15, 30 minutes, an hour, or they may never show up. So how do you train yourself? How would you protect your house? How would you, you know, there's a ton. I meet so many people 
America, I am a huge fan of the Second Amendment. Uh, and, and I personally believe every American should have a gun. And there's a lot of people that have guns. But the problem is, most of them, a lot of them don't know how to use them. I can't believe how many people I meet that are like, oh, yeah, I have a gun. I'm like, oh, where is it? And they're like, oh, you know, it's in my drawer. It's locked in the safe and uh, closet. And I'm like, oh, right on. Well, when was the last time you shot it? Oh, I shot it like a year ago. And I'm like, huh. Right. And they're, uh, or they'll say, yeah, I got it next to the bed, but it's not loaded. And I'm like, oh, well, where are your bullets? And they're like, oh, they're locked in the safe. And I'm like, so let me get this straight. You basically have a uh, paperweight in your drawer that right. if there's a crisis, you'll be able to pull that out and hopefully club somebody with it. You know, it, it, it's, it's a mindset of training and readiness. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be, once again, it doesn't need to be this Navy SEAL level. It just needs to be, a lot of people will say to me, what's the best gun? What's the best gun you recommend to protect yourself? It's the one you know and you trained with. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say are like the three or four kind of entry level steps for the average person who's doesn't want to seem like some crazy and you know, they have all it's weird. People have all this ambivalence around like their choices in life. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I enjoy life a lot more now that I'm less insecure than I used to be, but let's assume somebody's like, just wants to like gently dip their toe in the shallow end of the preparedness pool. What are the basic things they should start with? How would you defend your health, your house? If someone tried to break in, you know, I would mm -hmm. think about that. I would think about how would I survive if for at least a minimum of two weeks, I'd recommend a month. How would I survive for a month if I was unable to go to the grocery stores or get food? Um, do you keep your cars full of gas at all time? I mean, it's a big one I hammer with my family, my kids. Mm. I'm like, your car should be full of gas. You never know what's going to happen that suddenly... In it, remember last year we had the um, East Coast pipeline that um, that had the cyber attack. You remember this? And it shut down a lot of our fuel distribution here on the East Coast. No, so I, suddenly, I missed it. I'm I'm out here in the desert in the West. I think we okay. Missed so here moment. on the East Coast, so it created massive lines and a fuel shortage for a period of time. So individuals who had low tanks when it occurred and it wasn't long it was maybe three or four days five days but if you were low on gas so now imagine if you had that situation and suddenly an emergency hit you wouldn't have had gas to get out so it's it's a mindset of readiness it's you know survival water you know water is the most critical thing we need so you need at least um you know i would recommend two weeks of water, or at least something that enables you to get water, water pur purification tablets. You know, uh, I, I have several different water pur purification devices in my emergency bags. Uh, and then of course, you know, a basic mindset of how do I defend myself? You know, okay. is it a bat? Are you afraid of guns? If you're afraid of guns, okay, then what else can you use? Uh, but definitely- or, or how can you get over your fear of guns? <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a second amendment guy too. I'm like, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't, well, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but yes, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm with you. But, it, but it's, it's having a plan and it's yeah. doing a little bit of training that makes the, and then having a mindset of, hey, I pray for the best. I tell you, I pray for the best. I, I, I've been in war. I've been in bad situations. I don't ever want to see it again. I fought so that my kids can have a great future. Like I pray that our political leaders will wake up and, and recognize that the majority of America is in the middle and we want a, a good life. But right now I feel like both sides are like, no, we've got to fight for the extreme on the right or the left. Right. And I just, oh, I mean, polarity, you know, polarization gets attention and attention sells advertising. It does. Yeah. You and know, if, media, I mean, if, if, if we had sane, media. if we were having sane press conferences that the media wouldn't even want to cover them. Which is how it should be. Yeah, That's yeah exactly. Yeah, but, politics should actually be fair, so so uninteresting and uncontroversial that you turn on TV and they talk about other stuff. Yep, but, but we have created this massive, sensational, negative news cycle. Uh, everybody's in a state of emergency. Everybody's in a state of sensationalism. And I mean, it's contributing to the, the mental health issues. Uh, so control what you can, plan for an uncertain future. Uh, I'm going to be running my first events course uh, here 
in the next couple of months, I hope to do a few of them, but that's what we're going to be teaching mindset, survival, defense. So, so this, uh, this episode probably will be out, you know, in, a, in, I'm guessing within about a month, it sounds like you'll be pretty close to your first event. So if somebody's hearing this, they could go to your website and potentially learn about what you're doing to, to offer this type of training preparedness training. Is that fair enough? That's right. Yep. Cause okay. even if, uh, even if they miss that first one, my plan is to run three this year and it's just a one day workshop to okay. give you the basic skills and, and, and to take home and, uh, and, and be able to execute some of these things. And so, that's Jason, jasonredmond.com. That's right. Okay. And actually on that note, since we're actually out of time, um, tell us where else people can go and, and where you would steer people that want to get to know you better or get your book or, you know, have you come speak like everything you offer steer, steer the audience, please. Yeah. Jasonredman.com is the main place. So if you, you know, I, I speak on leadership, I speak on overcoming adversity. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I mean, frequently over and over again, I hear, man, one of the best speakers we've ever had. And, uh, and it is because guys, I deliver content that's relatable that your people or your company will walk away with and say, wow, not only what that was great, but I can use it in my life. I can use it in our company. I can use it in my team. I can use it in my family. And I think that's critical at the end of the day, if you're going to hire somebody, you want people to have actionable steps to take. So book me for speaking. Uh, obviously all three of my books are on my website and then on, I'm on all the socials. Uh, you know, those links are on there, but you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and, uh, and you can get those six shirts too. If you're noticing, right. you can't see his cool shirt, but you can get those you two get on your, that uh, no bad days shirts. And actually with this new course, man, we're just, we're going to be releasing, this is a top secret, but we're re releasing our new Victor, not victim shirt. No, so I like it. it's, it's pretty sick. I'm excited. Uh, we just saw the design from my graphic designer tomorrow. So that that sure will be coming out within the next month. You know, I'm going to I'm going to end by sort of pointing something very obvious out, but I think it's so actionable and applicable for for so many people. You know, you had something horrible happen to you. That horrible thing that happened to you is and 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 more specifically the way you responded to it is why you're able to go onto a stage. It's why you're able to get in front of so many people and immediately command respect, have, have authority. Cause yeah, I mean, there, you got to respect somebody that, you know, has, has been through something worse than you, right? Like I, I have a natural respect for you. Cause I know I've never been through anything, at least in my mind, that's as bad as what you've been through. And that's, and so my point is when these really horrible things happen to people do what Jason did and, and respond and, and adapt and, and move, get off the X. And then you now have something of, of it, that's impossible to, to quantify and value as currency that you can take with you into the future of your life and use to impact people and use to command respect and use to have the authority and use to actually as a platform to serve the world from, you know, adversity. I'm reading uh, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill right now. And adversity creates so much opportunity depending on how you respond to it. And I just, I want to, I wanted to point that out and I want to honor and acknowledge, you know, what you've been able to do with your adversity. It's yeah, a, it's, Jeff, it's I, cool. I, if, if you guys want uh, my Ted, my Ted talk is called how to get through hard times. And it's all about getting off the X, but there's one critical principle. I tell people to, to well, actually two things. Number one, when you're in a major life ambush or you get punched in the face with adversity, it's human nature to think it's the end. And sometimes it is. Sometimes it's the end of one phase of your life. Uh, when I got all shot up, it was the end of my SEAL career. But one of the most amazing thing about the end moments is so often it becomes a new beginning if you're willing to embrace it and go after it. And I know so many wounded warriors and people have been through trauma that had a major the end moment and, and they launched on a new beginning and they say, man, that the end moment was one of the best things that could have ever happen to me. And, and then the last principle I'll leave you with is this. Whenever something bad happens to you, when you have a the end moment, the greatest gift you have as a human being is you have a choice. You have a choice in how you're going to deal with it. Nobody holds you down and says, hey, man, you got to lay here and feel sorry for yourself because you got screwed over on that business deal or because you got shot up or you failed as a leader. You have a choice. So choose positivity, drive forward, figure out what your new beginning is, man. And that's, 
That's it. That's how you overcome. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. You have to have that ability to act in the now and think ahead. You're the one that has to make decisions right now based on the best information you have, but then you ask well, what next questions. What do I need to think about next? What do I need to plan for next? And what do I need to do next?